forgiveness uh, because of the sin that's in our lives. And, and we, Father, we, uh, we confess that, uh, that many times we don't realize the sin that's around us and the sin that's in our heart as well. And it starts with us. We pray this morning that you will forgive us of our sin. We need to confess our sin before you. So now in the quietness of our hearts, we confess our sins. So it, in the, one of the challenges, I think, of even watching the news and hearing what, what's going on, the protests, the looting, is what do you say? And so um, one of the things I, I, I seek uh, is my words are not wise many times. I don't have the history. You know, I'm, I'm not African-American. So even if I were attempted to say something, you know, have, uh, it, it, uh, uh, you know, how do I understand? Even you know when I say you know, my uh, my uh, you know, my son has been has faced racism in the last week at, at work. So uh, a uh, a woman came drove up to the in the drive thru and started screaming at him to take COVID, blaming him for COVID nineteen because he's Chinese American. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> so, but that's not. But you can say well in, in this you know long history of of uh, racism against Chi Chinese Amer Asian immigrants, right? But it's not, you know, but it's not the same as the, as maybe the deep-seated racism against African Americans, but the heart issue is the same. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's the challenge. And, um, and so, uh, so I've been, you know, searching for, you know, uh, the words of others, you know, that, that are smarter than I am and, and, uh, uh, and, and can speak more eloquently. And so the, the best one I came across by former President George W. Bush, who was a man of God, and I really respect him, um, and uh, and so I'm going to read his his statement because I think it really before I before I read the, 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 the scripture because I think it really uh, addresses the issue and, and it helps us to learn and and it's very appropriate as a response. Um, and so he writes on behalf of his wife and him. He says, Laura, uh, Mrs. Bush and I are anguished by the brutal suffocation of George Floyd and dis disturbed by the injustice and fear that suffocate our country. Yet we have resisted the urge to speak out because it's not the time for us to lecture. It's time for us to listen. It's the time for America to examine our tragic failures. As we do, we will see some of our own redeeming strengths. So that's a biblical word, redemption. Uh, that's what I said. That's not what he said. Mm -hmm. Uh, it remains a shocking failure that many African Americans, especially young African American men, are harassed and threatened in their own country. It is a strength when protesters, protected by responsible law enforcement, march for a better future. This tragedy, in a long series of similar tragedies, raises a long overdue question. How do we end systemic racism in our society? The only way we see ourselves in a true light is to listen to the voices of so many who are hurting and grieving. Those who set out to silence those voices do not understand the meaning of America or how it becomes a better place. America's greatest challenge has long been to unite people of very different backgrounds into a single nation of justice and opportunity. The doctrine and habits of racial superiority, which once nearly split our country, still threaten our union. The answers to American problems are found in living up to American ideals fundamental truth that all human beings are created equal and endowed by God with certain rights. We have often underestimated how radical that quest really is and how our cherished principles challenge systems of intended or assumed injustice. The heroes of America, from Frederick Douglass to Harriet, Harriet Tubman to Abraham Lincoln to Martin Luther King Jr., are heroes of unity. Their calling has never been for the faint-hearted. They often reveal the nation's disturbing bigotry and exploitation, 
stains on our character sometimes difficult for the American majority to examine. We can only see the reality of America's need by seeing it through the eyes of the threatened, oppressed, and disenfranchised. That is exactly where we stand now. Many doubt the justice of our country, and with good reason, African-American people see the repeated violation of their rights without an urgent and adequate response from American institutions. We know that lasting justice will only come by peaceful means. Looting is not liberation. Destruction is not progress. We also know that lasting peace in our communities requires equal justice. The rule of law ultimately depends on fairness and legitimacy of the legal system. Achieving justice is for all is the duty of all. This will require consistent, courageous, and creative effort. We serve our neighbors best when we try to understand their experience. We love our neighbors as ourselves when we treat them as equals in both protection and compassion. There's a better way, the way of empathy and shared commitment and bold action and peace rooted in justice. Uh, I'm confident that together Americans will choose a better way. So I thought that was, that was very uh, well written and, uh, and, 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 and expresses the challenge very well. And another um, takeaway is, is I think it's important to learn. He's talking about listen. So I want to listen to the voices of history. So I've read quite a bit about the times when there was segregation. So we used to live in Lubbock, Texas, in West Texas, and the schools were segregated until 1972, which is not that long ago. There was an African-American high school and a white high school in Lubbock, Texas. And even now, there's de facto segregation. There's kind of an African-American part of town and a, and, a, and a white part of town and a Hispanic part of town. So there's still this, the segregation, even though it's it, 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 uh, it's not really, you know, it's not legal. So it's a big challenge, but I think it, uh, it turns us to look, look at our own lives and to learn, but also to, uh, to learn from God's Word. And so uh, amazing that this passage, which I chose before uh, uh, the last uh, couple of weeks happened, uh, addresses a, a solution to this, which is the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are what we need right now. Everybody needs the qualities, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So uh, the scripture is Acts 2, uh, verses 42 to 47. Go, please stand for the reading of God's Word. So Acts 2, 42 to 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its power. We pray this morning that we'll be able to learn from your word and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. And so this uh, passage is, is a, a bit of a hinge point in uh, the book of Acts, in the life of the church, because... Uh, the Holy Spirit has come, so Pentecost was the gift, which was last Sunday, was when the Holy Spirit was 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 released, basically. And very, very exciting. Um, and then you say, well, what happens next? You know, if the gift of Jesus is gone to heaven, and if the Holy Spirit is here as our guide and comforter, what does that look like practically? And even right before this it, it is, is basically a, a, a sermon the first part of Acts 2, um, uh, Peter gives a sermon, and that goes from Acts 2.14 uh, to um, uh, into verse 40. And, uh, and, and so verse 41 of Acts 2, uh, the culmination of the, of the sermon by Peter, which, which is wonderful uh, to read because it's, it's such a powerful sermon. And it says, uh, so those who receive his word are baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. So those are you know, new Christians, 
And so again, the question is, what, what do they do next? It's not about, uh, uh, we know from Matthew 28, uh, uh, it's not about uh, converts, it's about disciples. And the discipleship should happen within the church. And so, uh, basically, I, uh, to summarize Acts 2, 42 to 47, it's really the church walking in the Spirit, in the Holy Spirit. What does that look like? Uh, and so, uh, we know from this passage that the new Christians uh, continued to use the temple to meet, the, the Jewish temple, because there was not a church building. It's, it's not enough time to build a building anyway. But, it's, it's, uh, but uh, we know that they met in homes also. And so a lot of what is described is, is what we call house church, because there's no, uh, no church like we know it. And, uh, so this is basically describing the activities of the early church. So it's very exciting. Uh, and, uh, and those 3,000 new Christians uh, that, that uh, came as a result of Peter's uh, preaching uh, needed instruction, needed discipleship. And they also needed fellowship. They needed to meet with other Christians. And so it's an exciting time uh, because these are, the, the goal is to make disciples. And we know if someone prays a prayer of salvation but doesn't become a disciple, you know, that, that's not, uh, not uh, helpful for the body of Christ. And um, also we know that if, 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 um, if people are not in fellowship in, uh, and filled with the Holy Spirit, then, uh, then they, 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 they are not being used by God. So we know the early church uh, was devoted to the apostles' teaching. Uh, it says in the beginning of verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So they had, you know, they didn't have the Bible really. They had, they had the, the, the Greek, or the uh, Jewish scriptures, the Torah, but they, you know, they don't have, they don't have, <laughs> they don't have much. Uh, so it's oral, and that's that's something that we learn quite a bit. Is uh, you know that a lot of spiritual truths are passed down orally, and so uh, it would have, you know, it would have been Jesus' earth, earthly teaching from his from his. Uh, three years of ministry passed on orally, and then uh, what he taught the disciples in his 40 days of walk, uh, after his resurrection. So that's very recent. You know, so uh, there's no time to write anything down. So, so that's interesting. So you know, in the world today, so much of spiritual truth is learned orally, even though people are literate. And that and advantages it, it can be it can be passed along. Uh, the word, uh, when it says, uh, and the fellowship, the Greek word is koinonia. Koinonia is a word uh, that appears 19 times in the Greek uh, New Testament, 12 times it's translated as fellowship. And so that's, that's, uh, that's the most common translation. Also means participation. So participating together. And also uh, uh, several times it's translated as sharing. So that's interesting to think about this. Fellowship really means sharing um, and, uh, and, and, and in community. And what did they share? Um, and we see, very, uh, as, as you look on to, to verse 44, uh, they said they had all things in common. They're selling their possessions, belongings, distributing belongings, and distributing the proceeds to all that they had need. And so uh, what they were doing was sharing material goods, uh, breaking bread together, which is eating together. But also, I, I really believe, uh, and we don't know for sure, it means taking communion. So there's some churches that every Sunday they have communion. Uh, the, the Catholic tradition, right, Roman Catholic, whenever you go to Mass, you take communion. So that comes from this interpretation. Uh, but I think it also means having a meal together, because we know that's very powerful. But I, I, I miss the, the, the no, no meals here is a big, <laughs> a big uh, disadvantage, right? I, I, I love tempeh so much, and I haven't had it in, in that, over a year, maybe. Anyway, so yeah, so, so food is so important, and that's... Even though the church has reopened, it's a little bit sad that there's no food. My favorite restaurant, one of my favorite restaurants, Soup Plantation, it's closed. And I have, I have about $100 of gift cards, too. So even more sad. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so, so breaking bread together is so important. Uh, and then, uh, uh, so, uh, so that's one, one, you know, in terms of the actions, one is the breaking of bread together. Uh, but it seems like even when they when they ate their regular meals together, uh, they would they would uh, they would end with with uh, with uh, 
breaking the bread and drinking wine because that was part of the normal, normal meal. And so it seems like even in a regular meal, perhaps they ended with communion. Uh, that's, that's, uh, because that's what Jesus had said, do that and remember something. He didn't say do it one Sunday a month, or, you know, he just said do it. And so I think that's the interpretation here. Um, and then the fellowship, you know, this koinonia uh, is, is much more than just being together. Sometimes we say, oh, you know, we're having fellowship tonight, that you know, it means we're meeting together. But it's much, it's much deeper, it, it, as I said, when you look at the meaning about participation, sharing, but it means having in common. So it seemed like uh, they were they were uh, they were uh, not having private ownership of a lot of material things, and you know many uh, and even it says yeah if, if we uh, uh, if we go down to verse forty four uh, it said they had all things in common which I'll, I'll come to in a second but uh, verse forty three. Uh, is important. And awe came about upon every soul, and many wonders and signs would be done through the apostles. And so this is the idea that there were miracles. So the, this is called the apostolic era, and there's, uh, there were still uh, uh, the, the, the signs of the Holy Spirit's power and presence result in miracles. Uh, so that's, it's not specific, but it seems like uh, not not, uh, they weren't all written down, but there were a lot of miracles happening, and this is this is the, due to the Holy Spirit, because Jesus before did the miracles, right? But when Jesus left, and He empowers through His Holy Spirit uh, believers with the gifts of the Spirit, which include healing and miracles, so that so we we know that uh, is biblical. So it seemed like there were regular miracles, and then yeah, in verse forty-four it talks about all things in common, and so I used to kind of joke about that. Oh, this is the first instance of communism. <laughs> in history, you know, and that's a bad word, you know, in the, in the West, you know, the, the, uh, to be a communist. But this is clearly not the case. So, it, so I, I don't joke about it anymore. When you look at the biblical reason, uh, the giving was voluntary and not compelled by the government. That's the, you know, that's the, the one of the problems with communism among many is is that you're forced to not have anything private. But it was voluntary from the heart, and also. People still had personal possessions, uh, and why do we know that? They met in homes, so, you, so they, there was home ownership. So it's t uh, true communism uh, means means that you don't own anything except for maybe your toothbrush or something like that, right? But but the you know the government owns everything. So clearly, uh, this is this is not communism, and we also know as you know um, when we uh, look ahead in Acts. Um, there's the story of Ananias and, Ananias and Sapphira, and they were uh, uh, they they lied about the sale of their property, and God zapped them dead. So we'll get to that later in Acts, but but, but clearly there was ownership of property, um, and, uh, and that, but that's a big tenet of commun true communism is you don't own any property. Um, so, uh, but volu voluntarily. Sharing possessions and being generous is what is what is what is uh, the emphasis here. That they were voluntarily sharing possessions, and that's you know that's one thing I love about my Indian friends. You know, there's not a sense of this strong private ownership of things. You know, when I go visit an Indian uh, uh, friend, let's say students at Cal State, they go in their apartment and I'm wearing sandals, and so we take off our sandals, you know, of course, at the door, and then there's a big pile of them. And I sit down on the floor and eat, and when I'm done eating, I get up to go, my sandals are gone. <laughs> Why? Because somebody else uh, had big feet maybe, and said, oh, those, you know, those are fine. But there's no sense of, you know, so I thought, well, that's weird. But when you think about it, um, if there's no private, it doesn't matter, right? I, don't, I, don't, I shouldn't care if somebody borrows my sandals, right? And, um, and even uh, sometimes Indians will borrow camping equipment from me. And they don't think about returning it sometimes, <laughs> because because it's just not a sense that this is my you know that is mine and and and, and yours. It's, it's it's if I have if I own it, then they are they are um, then it's like they own it too. Isn't that interesting. So it's a little bit unnerving, right? <laughs> but uh, even in, 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 you know, but it, you know it, it, you know where do you draw a lot? Because you know whenever uh, my Indian friends cook, it's all communal. You know that's the same. You know. Whereas, 
you know, my family, we like to have our own plate, right, with our own things. And my brother and I, when we were growing up, used to fight over the food, right? We would, we would kind of hoard it. And, uh, but, but the uh, Indians, they even use the same plate when they eat. Isn't that interesting? And so, so there's just a different, a different view. But, but I, and I think it's more biblical, right, to, to not have things, uh, you know, this private ownership of things that are, you know, that, that are to, and really it's being generous. Right? When you, and it's a matter of the heart. If, I, if my heart is clean to, to some, something I own, that's not healthy. Right? And so, uh, uh, but, but I think I love this term, voluntary generosity and sharing possessions. So um, one of the things that, that has happened out of this in history, especially in the West, is that uh, a, uh, a Christian or even a pastor will read this and say, well, we're not doing it right. We're meeting in a building. We're... You know, we're not being generous, we're not sharing possessions, so we should start our own, uh, we, should, we should go back to the early church, you know, and, uh, and so we should start a Christian commune. You heard that word before? So commune is, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, is, is uh, uh, when you look at history, the last couple hundred years, there have been many communes started, mostly in the U.S., and so commune comes from the word community. Okay, so it's so, and when you look at when you look at the the kind of the, the, the rules, you uh, and the intention usually it says something about the early church. We want to model the early church. If it was good enough for you know for, uh, for right after Pentecost, you know there, there's some advantages, and we sh we should do it. And so here here's an example from the internet. I I just pulled up it, and I like this one because it's called Koinonia Farm. So that's that Greek word. So fellowship farm, sharing farm. So it says Koinonia Farm. This is in Georgia. Uh, it was founded in 1942 by Clarence and Florence Jordan and Martin and Mabel England as a demonstration plot for the kingdom of God. This meant a community of believers in Christ sharing their lives and resources following the example of the first Christian communities as described in the Acts of the Apostles. So you, you constantly see that description of you know, the motivation and then usually they, they uh, uh, so they move to a central place, and uh, and then people they, they try to model this uh, early church experience, which means they don't have private ownership of uh, most things. They uh, they oh, they eat their meals together, they share the work. So so it was pretty common in throughout history that it would be a farm because you have to you, you have there has to be work to do and and. Uh, and so um, that it said Koinonians share not only faith and resources, but also work. Uh, we farm our livelihood and sought ways to work in partnership with the land, to conserve the soil of God's holy earth. Uh, and yeah, so, so you know, that's one example. So here's the mission statement. We are Christians called to live together in intentional community, sharing a life of prayer, work, study, service, and fellowship. We seek to embody peacemaking, sustainability, and radical sharing. So that's what they use for this idea of not having uh, uh, private possessions. While honoring people of all backgrounds and faith, we strive to demonstrate the way of Jesus as an alternative to materialism, militarism, militarism, and racism. So it's really interesting because when I look, so I want you want to know how did it turn out, right? What happened to, to, to these to this group? And so um, I, I was interested in that. Uh, and so the principles they started with um, one of the principles was nonviolence as alternative to violence, so pacifism. And so throughout history, there are there are a number of these uh, koinonia fellowships that uh, that kind of added fruit of the Holy Spirit to, uh, to, what, to what is here uh, in Acts 2. So remember the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, right? So if you take that literally, it means you know, non-violence, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and that's another thing we shouldn't fight anybody, and self-control. So, so living out the Holy Spirit is implied by this. But, uh, and so this group said we need to focus on the pacifism and so and uh, unity. And so it turned out in history that this is in the, Georgia is in the deep south. So 1942, there's a lot of racism and segregation. 
so this group became a big part of the civil rights movement, and because they would they would they would hire African American laborers and pay them the same as the white laborers, um, and, and so they were and they they had a farm they had a, a roadside stand to sell things that they would farm, and multiple times it was attacked by a group called the Ku Klux Klan. So they were the mo probably the most racist anti. Um, African American uh, uh, groups, terrible, terrible principles. Anybody, have you heard of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's in history. Yeah, they had white hoods. Oh, that. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this, yeah, so this group, even though they were, they were not African American, they were targeted by the Ku Klux Klan because they thought they favored African Americans. And so when you look at the history, I put out the timeline. Uh, Local businesses begin boycott of Quinn and New Farm. Boycott continues to the 1960s. No one sells or buys from the farm. So that was organized by the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, 1956, shops fired into Quinn and New homes from the highway. 1957, produce stand bombed and destroyed. 19, uh, Ku Klux Klan holds a rally and drives to Quinn and to threaten more violence unless farm is sold. Uh, students from Koinonia, then later it says students from Koinonia Farm became the first white people in history of the United States to be refused admittance to a local public school representing the community. So that was, so they were, they were considered, they were, they were uh, targeted uh, by the racist movements. Uh, and, you know, so that, that's the history. And so, so that was fascinating that there's a tie between the racism, you know, the experience racism, even though they were not African American, and that's that's the history that we are seeing played out, you know, the protests. It's just like it was a long history of uh, mistreatment of African Americans. You know, when you read this, you say, "Wow, that's crazy! How could they? How could they? You know, how could somebody do this?" And they're trying to live out the principles of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and then, so one one more fascinating thing about this is later there was a uh, so uh, usually these these uh, communes or communities are. Are attractive, you know, they, they need to attract new residents, you know, more workers and all that. And, uh, and so uh, later, I think it was 1972, uh, where is it? Oh, it, it was one of the couples that was attracted to this model and their, their values uh, in 1968 was a couple named Millard and Linda Fuller and their children. You know that name? He's the founder of Habitat for Humanity that builds houses all over the world for the needy. So Millard Fuller and his wife became residents of that community. And so many of their principles of you know, not having private ownership, living out the early church has 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 translated into habit. Have you heard of Habitat for Humanity? Yeah, yeah. So that's basically it's it, and, and uh, a, a number of churches are involved. Uh, but all over the world, uh, uh, they will identify a family that doesn't have a home, can't afford a home, and they will build a bit with volunteer labor to build a house. And, uh, and look it up on the internet, Habitat for Humanity, and then we'll, we'll give the house. I think the, the prospective uh, resident will have to do work as well, and then the house is given free of charge. So Habitat for Humanity comes out of this early church model. So it was fascinating when I read that. This, just with this one, uh, what some would call a commune. So, you know, when we look at this, um, they didn't always turn out like this, though. Okay, so, so, uh, so I'm going to read a, a, another response because, uh, especially in the U.S., there's been a lot, over the over the last 150 years, there have been a lot of efforts to start communities or communes. Um, uh, have you heard of Oneida Silverware? So Oneida is probably the highest quality of silverware, and that started with a, with a with a Christian commune that went bad, so it didn't last very long because it, it had non-biblical beliefs. So uh, have you heard of Shakers, Shaker Furniture, or the Amish? Oh, okay. yeah, so that's a lot of these same principles. We don't want to be bothered by technology, they say, it's, but you have to have a business to to you know to to survive if you if you're in a commune. So. Uh, 
So here, here's, here's something more about these communities. I'm kind of dwelling on this because it, 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 it's so practical and it's, it's part, of, part of history. So there, there is an emphasis uh, sometimes in this communal living. So um, this is a couple that writes, in the past year, uh, my friends have been obsessed with the idea of creating community and now they want us to sell our home, move with them to a rural area and help them start a Christian commune. We're really struggling with this. For one thing, the idea sounds cultic. So it turns out a lot of the uh, communes that start uh, is often a charismatic leader who goes off track. And so a lot of the, some of the cults we read about uh, that, that, that are terribly destructive and, and unbiblical started as Christian communes uh, based on these principles. But then very quickly it goes bad. So, uh, so the idea sounds cultic. For another, we have a feeling that they're motivated to do this primarily because they have problems with authority, especially the local church. So that's the motivation sometimes. They don't want a pastor telling them what to do. They want to have shared responsibility, shared leadership. Uh, and so they also seem to want to escape the responsibilities. Uh, so it says this is... Uh, so nowadays, most of us tend to associate the word commune with a left-wing political extremism or abusive and theologically misguided cultic group. So that's when, it, when we say commune, even though the, the root of the word is community and really koinonia, it, it's, 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 um, the word commune has a very bad connotation because so many cults do that. Uh, so this perspective isn't unreasonable. We all know that it has a pretty firm basis in fact. Uh, nevertheless, the, less the connection isn't necessarily valid. So it says, as a matter of fact, experiment, experiment in, in communal Christian living can be positive, beneficial, and God-honoring if they're carried out in the right way. Everything depends on the people involved and the reasons for doing what they're doing. Um, if you study history, you'll discover, discover there are, it's always been a strong impetus towards communal expressions of the Christian life within the Orthodox Church. The tradition has solid biblical roots, uh, and it mentions Acts 2. Um, it's, it, so this tradition has, has found expression in everything from the primitive monastic communities of the ancient desert fathers to the early American Shakers, that's the group that makes the furniture, uh, in, uh, and then it mentioned the present day group. Uh, but what about Catholic monks and nuns? Are they living in this kind of community? Yeah, so I, I was interesting when I thought about that. Yeah, so we, you know, in San Gabriel we see the, we see the nuns walking around you know, the mission sometimes, you know, so what are they, they're, are they living according to this? You know, they don't own, the nuns don't own anything. Uh, they, you know, they have shared responsibilities, they break bread together, you know, so, so it's interesting. So that's, in some ways, that, that's, that's an expression of Acts 2, 42 to 47. Uh, monks, nuns, uh, and also groups that are involved in inner city ministry. So in Pasadena, uh, there's there's a, a it's, it's called Harabi Center Maranatha the, maybe Josh was there so that's in some ways trying to model this as a as a as a as a, as a community that is trying to live according to the Holy Spirit and pass those principles on uh, there's a very famous uh, Los Angeles pastor named John Perkins who has great great ministry uh, urban ministry and the idea is. Uh, to create a strong, vital, and visible communal demonstration of what it means to live as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so that's kind of the, that's, this expression, again, that comes from this. So sometimes we say fellowship means that we are, we are, we are in the same family and we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, so uh, and so, this, so the, then, then this, this article kind of mentions you know, that uh, we're all called to this kind of behavior. And so that's the difference is it's about our hearts. And so, whether we live in a commune or not, we should live according to these principles, which is spirit-filled. So sometimes I think we get distracted, and people get distracted by this idea of no common ownership. When in fact, that's one of the most, one of the hardest things, because that's the deepest thing in our heart. That was my struggle with Indians, right? <laughs> to say, well, <laughs> they, they own my sandals just as much as I do. You know, and so now I say, you know, when they borrow something from me, you know, I, I write it down because they don't write it down even, but, but I, or I take a picture of it. So I just so I re remember because I know I probably won't see it for a while until I remind them. 
uh, but, but but it's my heart issue, right? Why can't I give up my my my, my camping tent, my sleeping bag? You know, I have a lot of them. <laughs> Why can't I give that up? Why am I holding on? It doesn't matter, right? The relationship is more important than my private ownership, and that's really what this is saying. The relation with God, right, and with our brothers and sisters is more important. Christ is more important than anything we own. So that's the deep principle of that, uh, and so. Uh, and so it says, whether we know it or not, we are all, you know, we are all supposed to live in communion. That's one thing about the church, the ecclesia is the Greek word. It should, it should model this. I know this church, that's why it's exciting today, because the people are back together, and even though six feet apart. <laughs> but that's, you know, that, that's really what, you know, what this is describing is what church is all about, right? Um, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, Paul had to remind the early Christians about this. But the downside is that it's, 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 it's hard to make this work in the real world. You know, so that was, you know, uh, if people have problem with authority now, moving, you know, moving to a, a, com a farm and a commune in the country is not going to help because it's a heart issue. And we need to give authority to God. And so uh, uh, it's, really, it's really a discipleship issue. So I think that's why Paul was, was writing, or uh, Luke was writing this. Because it is a, it's a discipleship. How can we be discipled? How can we live out uh, according to the fruit of the Holy Spirit? How can we embody the Holy Spirit? It's in community. Um, and and uh, but the problem is you know, the, 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 the downfall of communes. And I've actually during a, one of my a church history class, because uh, uh, in seminary there was a very interesting class about the, the early church in America and. There were a lot of, there, there were some that started as communities or communes that become actually churches, like the Shakers. The Amish, you know, Pennsylvania, so that's really, they're living according to these principles, but it becomes a church. But you, but sometimes, it, you know, it really depends on who the leader is. And so if, it, if, it's, a, if it's a crazy leader, cult, cultish leader, you know, then it doesn't last very long. Uh, and so as I read history, uh, often it, it, it um, and this is what's written here, uh, some fall apart almost immediately for lack of adequate authority. Because people are struggling with authority. If they look for, to human authority instead of God, that's a, that's a big problem. Or if they, if they don't like authority, it's, it doesn't matter if it's God or someone else, they're not going to kind of go for it. Uh, uh, others turn ugly and repressive and embrace heretical doctrines in an attempt to maintain control over the members. So sometimes, if you make rules, you know, they have all these rules, but, but people, that's an attempt for control, but that's not the spirit of it. It's not getting at the heart issue. Um, just like, you know, the, uh, the, 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 often a cultish group will have very strict rule. You can't eat this, you can't do this. Um, and not just in Christianity, many religions have, have these uh, rules, and that, that's what the Pharisees did. You know, they tried to legislate. Uh, love of God. When Jesus said, no, 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 it's about the heart. It's not about following rules. It's about your heart, loving God. Um, and so, uh, so, so the advice, uh, anyone who has actually tried to do it, what in these communes, it's extremely hard to pull off successfully. And that's what we see from history. Uh, that's the way it is when sinful, fallen human beings attempt to live together in close, close proximity. So the reality, when I read history, um, one of the issues is uh, is money. So the farm is one way, uh, but sometimes a group will say, well, you know, so-and-so has a, works for Google, and so they can fi they make enough money to finance all of us. So send that person off to work at Google, and, you know, and, and then they come back from work, and we'll do some, you know, we'll do the household chores, and we'll do the cooking, and, um, and, uh, but it turns out our, the human condition is, some of the members are going to be lazy. You know, say, I'm just going to sit around all day because so-and-so is making all the money, right? Mm -hmm. And so laziness is a big, people not, uh, we say, pulling their weight. And so that's a, that creates arguments and, uh, and also decision-making. You know, who makes the decisions? And so they will, they will often have a, a council that will meet together, a representative or everybody, but that's very hard to make decisions. Uh, and then child care is an interesting issue, raising a child, you know, when you have a child, and one, you know, who, who raises the child? Is it the whole community? Or is it the individual parents? 
if you're living in close proximity, you know, there's bound to be arguments, right? Even uh, different philosophy raising kids, because as if I know this with my, with my kids, if I told my 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 daughter, no, you can't do this, they would go and ask their mom mm -hmm. and wife, right? <laughs> you know, that didn't work. <laughs> they would they would maybe I mean they they could call call my brother, you know, call it that. So if you see that that's ripe for um, for. Uh, for problems, and then who does the boring work? You know, who who does the, the work that is you know, that is not as so much you know not, not so glamorous? You know, so so that's a big. And I even see this, you know, with with uh, Indian students I know. You know, they'll have you know, there'll be six in an apartment, and they have a chart written up, you know, for who does who does the cooking, who does the cleaning, who cleans the bathrooms, all this stuff. And they have to let they you know, have to write it out, but sometimes it doesn't work very well. Because somebody's lazy, right? Or they have an assignment, they have a legitimate reason, and so that creates tension. Uh, and then it also, you know, also whenever there's finance involved. So uh, when we look at, at so that, yeah, I spent a lot of time on that because that's is so interesting because we have historical examples of what happened when people try to live this way, and uh, and it doesn't usually work out. But uh, so what's often overlooked uh, is uh, is the heart. So when we when we uh, wrap this up by looking at uh, verses uh, 46 and 47. So this is often overlooked even by the groups that, that start. Uh, so 46 says, and day by day attending the temple together, so still worshiping, and, and that's the Jewish temple, yeah, but that's the place to worship God, uh, and breaking bread in their homes, they receive their food with glad and generous hearts. So it says about the heart, generous hearts, but also joyful hearts. And that's, that's sig that signifies a close relationship with God in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Remember the the, the uh, fruit of the Spirit, love, joy. Okay, so that's often overlooked. And then, verse 47, praising God and having favor with all people. And then it says, the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. So it's, it's also multiplicative. So the communes or communities that don't have these principles, who's going to want to come? They actually, people, more people leave than come. The ones that are truly living according to the Holy Spirit, these principles, they grow. Now, those are the ones that become a church. Because eventually you need, you, you need. so uh, so true revival. This is what's really happening uh, in, in, uh, after Pentecost. It's, it's a revival. It is it is uh, characteristic is spend time in worship. And so this is what we see. We often overlook this, um, but praising God is is um, is affirming God's sovereignty, uh, and uh, and He's the one that can change the hearts. And the more we worship. The more I think our hearts change, and we love God. So when we look at, you know, just summarizing this passage, the church uh, was unified. So together, this is the early church, not very big, but they're unified. Uh, there's not different denominations. It's magnified, as we see in verse 47, praising God, uh, and it has a powerful testimony. So that's another another reason this is, this is so powerful, um, uh, and not just because of the miracles but because of the generosity and the way they love one another. So ultimately, you know, uh, you know the New Testament is filled with the, with the one and others, to love one another. And when we're in close proximity, we, we, we have a choice of loving or, <laughs> or, or fighting, right? And so I think that's another advantage. I mean, this, you know, during the, during the uh, uh, shelter and home order, so all five kids are at home, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, that's different, especially the, during the curfew. Right, so we can't, we can't even. My wife and I couldn't even take a walk together, so we're we're, we're confined. And so we know we know not. Uh, sometimes there's there's anger, but ultimately for us it's been good because we have meal, we have dinner together every night, which we haven't done in years, right? And so ultimately, you know, it, 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 when we're in close proximity, when in community, it I think it it, it's a, it forces us either to love better or to or the opposite, right? And so that's been a challenge, I think. Uh, but, but ultimately, you know, my wife and I are thankful as we're saying, you know, our son is happier than he's been in about three years. Partly because he's out of high school now. <laughs> he doesn't have to get up at 7 a.m. to go to school. <laughs> but partly because we're, in, we're family again. And it's a big family, so that's an advantage. Um, so, um, 
So I think to, you know, to, to, to wrap this up, it, it, you know, the Christians that you meet in the book of Acts, and I, that's why I love the book of Acts, it's called Acts of the Apostles, it's also Acts of the Holy Spirit. You know, what happens with, after Pentecost, which, which I titled this message. Uh, so they weren't content just to meet once a week for services, as usual. Uh, they met daily, they cared daily, they witnessed daily, they searched the scriptures daily, and, and they increased in number. And so that's the model of the early church, not meeting you know, once a And even we haven't been able to meet in person anyway, right? By Zoom, Zoom isn't quite the same. Uh, so the Christian faith was a day-to-day -day reality, not once a week, because the risen Christ had given them the Holy Spirit when he went to heaven. So his resurrection power is at work in their lives through the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this amazing model of fellowship and yeah, it's so challenging because of sin but we pray father that you will help us in our own hearts uh, to praise you more uh, to embody uh, the fruit of the holy spirit in our own lives and to uh, live with this kind of generosity and worship uh, those, especially those two aspects uh, that, that were characteristic of the early church we thank you for this church thank you for today that this church can be together, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, and so we just pray that, that this will be a, a time of growth, and, but also a time of worship and, and uh, increasing the depth and understanding of your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen.